Good morning. Welcome to the, the third of our fourth four readings from our new uh, poetry anthology, Building Socialism, uh, organized and published by the Revolutionary Poets Brigade of San Francisco. I'm uh, John Curl, one of the four editors of the uh, anthology, the others being uh, uh, Jack Hirschman, Scott Bird, and Karen Melander Magoon. And um, you know, it's very strange and exciting to be coming to you at, at this at this point in history where you know everybody knows that it's a, you know it's a turning point in in many many different ways, and people are turning to poetry. You know, this this is a time. This is the kind of time that that people look to poetry for uh, things they need that they cannot get in the other way. And so people who have I'm not given a thought about poetry for, for 20 years are, are, are looking to poetry for, a, uh, for, for a nourishment and understanding and direction. So I'm going to read the prefatory from the anthology, which was uh, drafted by, uh, by Jack and uh, was, um, uh, uh, was uh, processed by uh, the entire group. So it's a, this, is, um, uh, this is an entire, uh, this, this, is, this is a group introduction. But you, you can hear you, you can hear the voice of Jack still coming through. Um, because when the pandemic of coronavirus took hold in, of the city of New York, synchronous with Italy, there rose up in the unconscious consciousness of many an instinct not only there, but all over the world, that only a socialism could save the dying international humanity. Because with the murder of George Floyd and the pouring into the streets of millions, as if to say that capitalism was the root cause of injustice and inequality, as if to say that this country's refusal to jail the leaders of the Ku Klux Klan and the Nazis who demonstrated in Charlottesville and to insist that racial bigotry is not free speech is among the root causes of police brutality because the Revolutionary Poets Brigade of San Francisco has already pub published six annual anthologies under the title of Overthrowing Capitalism, and this year voted to change the title to Building Socialism, realizing that words like socialism or communism are the most detested words in the lexicon of the thug billionaire president in power in the USA, and also out of deference to the motion of Bernie Sanders. For all these reasons, this year's anthology presents poetry and graphics related to all of the themes suggested here. Overthrowing capitalism, building socialism, the coronavirus siege, George Floyd, the poem of his last words, and the unstoppable momentum of a fierce new class of young people toward a new system of governance with real and genuine equality and with necessities provided to each and to all. So there it is, and uh, it's available online uh, at the usual uh, booksellers and uh, also through the um, uh, uh, lulu.com. So we're gonna start with, um, uh, with Nellie. Oakland born, Oakland Chinatown born, Nellie Wong is a socialist feminist activist and author of four poetry books. Two of her poems are installed at public sites in San Francisco, Oakland High School. Her alma mater has named a building after her. Nellie. Uh, unmute Nellie. Am I unmuted? Yes, you're unmuted. All right. Thank you so much, John. And it's great to be here with all of you, you know, from really all over the world. So that's really great that the technology can allow us to do this. I will read a poem called America in the Fillmore. And um, it's one of many what I call my street poems. And since I don't drive anymore, I take the bus and I take BART and other public tra 
ends it. So this is what happens. America in the Fillmore. Three Cantonese speaking women board the 22 wearing floppy cotton hats, each with luggage on wheels. Speaking rapidly with one another, one quickly sits at the front, usually reserved for elders or those passengers with disabilities. While two of them stand closely behind the bus driver, their face faces are unlined, their skin golden brown as the peasants of my parents' home village. They jostle and laugh, greeting each other as sister when another Cantonese woman boards and they all talk at once. Ay, ya, you here too. Hello, hello, yes, yes. The woman responds. The Cantonese woman surround an African-American woman dressed in a beige suit and a straw hat, pays no attention to their chatter. At Fillmore and Eddie, one of the women gets off, the other two sing in Toisanese, Fan Gi La, go home now. At Starbucks, I sip my small cup of decaf, looking out the window, I see two men and a woman all smoking, gathering in the morning sunlight under an umbrella. A young Japanese woman stops and joins the coffee drinkers, all admiring her dog on a leash. A woman in a Rosa Parks t-shirt at my left gets up. Oh no, she cries, my knee, my knee. Are you all right, I ask? Yes, but my knees always buckle. They always buckle. A customer dumps her canvas bag on the seat to my right and heads up to the counter. Then a gray haired black woman walks behind us holding her coffee cup. Visibly annoyed, she eyes the seat occupied by the bag. I say, it looks like she's getting coffee and not staying, but this seat's empty. I point to my left. The owner of the bag retrieves it and takes off. The black woman then takes the seat, probably because that's where she usually sits. The three of us get into a conversation about our hair inevitably graying. The woman in the Rosa Parks t-shirt says, oh, I just touch up my roots. The black woman then offers advice about how coloring your hair will affect the pigmentation of your skin while she bites into a strawberry. Her own hair is shoulder length with silver highlighting her chocolate brown skin. You have children, she asks. And I say, no, but I tried. Well, she says, not every woman needs to but I have four all grown and gone. I saw the Oprah show, I say, and there was a woman who left her baby girl in her car for eight hours. The baby died. The black woman looks at me, her eyes focused. How could any mother not know her babies in her car? Look, there are three rules, one, don't open your leg. Two, don't have sex. Three, if you have a baby, take care of it. It comes out of you with the woman, not the man. I'm turning 70 and I know, I know. Ooh. Yes. Christina Brown is a painter, poet, and writer who grew up in Japan and has lived most of her adult life in San Francisco. She often writes about what people will and won't do for love. Um, where is Christina? Christina, unmute yourself. Pardon me. Thank you, John. Um, hi, my name is uh, Christina Brown. I'm going to be reading two short related pieces today. 
The first was written seven summers ago for Michael Brown, the day after he was murdered by a police officer after being accused of stealing a box of cigars. Box, saints and power for Michael Brown. Again, another young man of color killed by the police under suspicious circumstances. Why, if you are poor, must you be a saint for your life to have any value? Why does a police officer's irrational fear justify your death? One mistake justify your murder. Why, if you are poor, do you bear the burden of everyone else's mistakes? I dreamed of a young man of promise about to escape, beat the odds. But he crossed the street. It turned into a nightmare, him being buried in a giant cigar box. It is an open casket funeral, his coffin filled with other young men of color in new suits, stacked like cigars, wrapped neatly in cellophane. His funeral procession hemmed in by squares of troopers in body armor and Nazi uniforms, blue, gray, and black, is sprayed with drops of bright red. High above, a shiny billboard says, rest in peace, rotates into trips to Vegas, other distractions. But how can he rest? How can we? Everywhere, People carry signs that say, we want justice. No one in power says it is a crime, a death penalty offense to be poor. But once you're murdered by the police without a trial, once you're dead, the attempt to justify your murder, excuse your killer, make it clear. To those in power, your life is less important than police authority. Sometimes it's time to protest in the streets. Nothing else seems to reach those in authority, even temporarily. Nothing else breaks the shoot to kill, calling the military mentality. Nothing else cuts the apathy, clears the hypocrisy, makes simple the supposed complexity of police murder. To speak out, to go into the streets, changes the equation, the balance of power, of concern. The second piece that I am going to read was written this past summer for George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and LeBron James. Change. We are marching in the street, coming up Columbus Avenue. It is a bright and sunny Sunday. Some bad cops and police chiefs have been fired. Some Confederate statues have finally been taken down. Some say it's superficial change, but it's a start. We chant, Black Lives Matter, say her name. We're all on message, black and brown and white, all mixed together, peaceful and proud. The police posture, try to look tough. We all know how brutal they can be, even with phones recording but we ignore them. 
filled with hope, feeling the power of all of us protesting together. We march, exchange smiles, laugh, and then chant some more. I'm wearing a bandana. Many people aren't. We're shoulder to shoulder. The pandemic rages, but I refuse to worry about catching the virus from the ground. My concern is who will vote. Resist the popular culture con of your vote can't matter, can't make any change. People who are cool don't bother to vote. During these protests for George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, every time a speaker talking about the power of voting pauses, my friends and I cheer as loudly as we can. We hear LeBron James is starting more than a vote to mobilize the black vote, fight voter suppression. He says, we want to be beautiful again. On and off the court. What a brilliant and beautiful and big hearted man. If we all march and we all vote, we can win, make real change happen. Thank you, Christina. Um, our next poet is Raymond Nat Turner. Uh, Raymond is a New York City poet, whoops, and director of Jazz Poetry Ensemble, Upsurge NYC, and has appeared at festivals like Panafest in Ghana, West Africa. He is also poet in residence at Black Agenda Report. Thank you, John. Um, and um, I'm excited to be part of the anthology and, a part, and excited also to be um, in the company of all the wonderful poets uh, from 25 different countries um, and in multiple languages, so. And kudos to all you who put in the work to make this anthology possible. So um, I have a piece in the anthology called uh, Ruling Class Remedies. If you're feeling exceptionally feverish are feverishly exceptional. Pull a tight fitting cherry red maggot cap over your forehead and eyes. Tight on your temples and clean cold pompous. White phosphorus poultices work wonders if your temperature is hotter than a hellfire missile, $110,000 each. Self-quarantine and waterboard yourself several times an hour. Scampaigns and selections and stress positions work too. You can use enhanced interrogation techniques until you're dry coughing and screaming, it's a Chinese hoax. It's a Chinese hoax. Hydrate yourself with fracking fluid or crude oil, or simply put a predator drone under your pillow. Suck on a nuke and F-35 exhaust will scorch phlegm from your respiratory tract, but wrap your home in plastic sheeting and seal it with duct tape. Remain calm you're safe. There's a wall to your west and boots are on the ground, slogging over shithole countries. Remember, bases ring the globe. Count bases if you're 
experiencing difficulty getting to sleep, play war games or practice military exercises, social distance yourself from anyone sneezing, spraying tiny droplets of health care for all or contagious germs of housing the unhoused or living wages. Thank you. Oh, thank, you thank you so much, Raymond. That's great. Thank you. I have to dash off. Thank you. Our next poet is Rafael Jesus Gonzalez, who is a lifelong activist for the earth, justice, peace, and the first poet laureate of the city of Berkeley, California. Rafael. Gracias. Rafael Jesus Gonzalez here. And um, I would mention that I was born and raised right on the US-Mexican border. And consequently, uh, grew up bilingually, biculturally, and uh, all of my works, or 99.7% of them, are uh, written in languages. Uh, growing up in the border was a very interesting experience, to say the least, because it made me uh, a disbeliever in borders. I do not believe in borders. I had family on both sides of the river, which was the boundary between Mexico and the United States, the Rio Bravo, the Rio Grande. And uh, well, what could one say except that what history teaches us? So, uh, a poem I will share with you is called Son Peligrosas Las Fronteras. Son peligrosas las fronteras. Líneas imaginarias que las mariposas ignoran. Las vigilan la muerte. Con corazón enredado de alambres de púas. En este canto oscuro, para hermano, hermana, padre, madre, hijo, hija, tío, tía, muertos por cruzar frontera, buscando pan, trabajo, hogar, huyendo persecución y violencia, muertos a manos de asesinos, sin o con placas policiacas. O cegados por la sed, por un sol implacable, o escalando un muro, o vadeando un río, respirando venenos en campos de fresa, o viñedos, muertos en fábrica, orca, miseria en cárcel en Texas o California o donde sea, mariposas tus almas que rondan fronteras. Borders are dangerous. Imaginary lines that butterflies ignore. Death keeps watch over them, heart wrapped in barbed wire. This dark song is for brother, sister, father, mother, son, daughter, uncle, and dead for crossing a border, seeking bread, work, home, fleeing persecution and violence dead at the heart of murder, at the hands of murderers with or without police badges. 
or cut down by thirst. By a relentless sun, kills climbing a wall or wading a river. Breathing poisons in strawberry fields or vineyards. Killed in factory or butchery. In jail in Texas or California or wherever. Butterflies their souls that haunt the borders. Nasokamati, gracias. Thank you. And thank you, Tlazi Komate. Thank you. Victoria Brill lives in San Francisco where great poets sprout like backyard weeds. She practices comradely affection toward all beings. Victoria. Voila. Hello, everybody. I'm very proud to be here among you. I'm going to read you my poem, Speak the Thing That Hurts Most. And it came to me out of a dream uh, where I was in a bar with some friends. And when the bartender asked me, what did I want? I said, I'm fine. I can't afford to drink in bars. And he said to me, I'll buy you a drink if you'll speak the thing that hurts most. So here it is. Perfidy, this is what hurts most. The disconnect of one from the other. The very idea of other. The tacit agreement that someone has to suffer the loss of sleep, the friend's betrayal, the scream stuck in the throat, the stifled internal weeping called tinnitus. What hurts most? The failure of imagination, dancing only from the waist up destitution of language, fake love, being afraid, and it's a detail, said Philippe Petit. Remember him? He danced across the abyss between the World Trade Towers while they still existed, high on a high wire strung between. What hurts most is the demands of ego, impotence, the inability to act, seeing it all turn to shit, loneliness, outright arrogance, bare-faced mendacity, abject poverty of the majority, the flowering, of corruption beyond endurance, coding in white face, data colonialism wrecking people's lives, algorithms of oppression like blood diamonds from ancient soil hurts. Slavery in every shape, racism, Recidivism, reductionism, revisionism, desire. Desire hurts. Desir por la vida, paz y amor. Always elusive, just out of reach. Sweetness turned bitter by way of powerlessness. Fear porn. Virtue signaling, fashion police, gentrification, no bread. The carefully orchestrated murder of planet Earth. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Victoria. 
Jenny Lim is a San Francisco jazz poet laureate emeritus. Her poetry music collaborations include Don't Shoot, A Requiem in Black, dedicated to Black Lives Matter. She has five poetry collections and the award-winning anthology Island, Poetry and History of Chinese Immigrants on Angel Island. Thank you. I want to thank the editors of this beautiful, all beautiful anthologies, Building Socialism. Um, Jack, thank you. Karen, Scott, and John. Great job. I love the poems in this. It's an honor to be part of it. This is COVID-19 dues. The city gives no signs of life. I've waited seven days lying in my bed, staring at the walls, looking out the window for any signs of passersby, any signs of life. The cupboards are bare, the refrigerator denuded of anything palatable. It's time to forge out along with the other foragers for precious commodities such as toilet paper and rice bread. I'm prepared to barter a king's ransom for bleach. All the shelves have been denuded. I need pearls for alcohol wipes. We're prisoners of war. Retired elders sentenced for our memories of forgotten wars. World War II, Vietnam, Iraq War, the war on terror by terror and other empire disasters. Then comes this unseen war, hunting us down like thieves, devouring the weakest amongst us for having been born. I crawl out of hiding, the streets still dark, the best time to forage. The sun's in the process of peeling back her sheet of darkness white silken clouds disperse to let her red corona shine, shine like fire, naked and bold over the abandoned orange city, the city that politics imprisoned, the city where the seat of power was hunger and greed unleashed from its bitter arsenal. A hideous virus that damns us all to our core and shatters our hallucination of in invincibility and might. The sun, indispensable to the movement of our universe, sears my mind. She can only issue from the same matter and spirit that imprisons us in our own sad creation, like the sun who burns for fruition's sake. The supreme task of human existence is to wrest from our hearts the self-destruction and rise like she to shine. Thank you. Okay. Are we allowed another one? No. <laughs> uh, we're, we're just reading the poems from the uh, from the anthology. So, right. okay. Um, Thank you. Uh, Virginia Barrett has seven books of poetry, including Between Looking, Crossing Hate, San Francisco Poems, and Occupy San Francisco, Poems from the Movement, of which she was the co editor. Thank you, John. Is my audio all right? It's fine. Great. I have a very short poem. Thank you to the editors as well for putting the lovely book together. Forceps, birth. The doctor forced me from my mother's womb. He drugged her heavily. No one asked permission. The birth was a violation. A woman's body turned into a dopey thing. Now is the demand for dignity. Held in the sea of heartbeat, this living is not about brutality. Who will cradle these heads 
in their hands, our push, our blood, our radiant screens. Thank you. And thank you, um, Virginia. Thank you very much. Uh, David Volpendesta is a member of the Friends of Duruti, the San Francisco Revolutionary Poets Brigade, and the Roque Dalton Cultural Brigade. His newest book is Forbidden Psalms. David Volpendesta. Can you hold it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is for Forbidden Psalm for the End of Imperialism. And this is dedicated to all comrades, foreign, domestic, and interplanetary. They can't turn salt on their brow into sugar. Pain in their eyes and misery is the lash of scorn given to the lives of workers who live on their backs as the whips of the rich whirl through the air, snap with a flick of the wrist to jar the atoms of consciousness hammered by iridescent pain, reflecting, reducing screaming women into puddles of flesh. Capitalism is a sadist, sharpening in its fangs to only to buy into flesh so that blood coagulates into muscles and sinews and pours it as it heads pours, through. Pours from the heart. Excuse me. As it pours through the hole in the head until it slows to a drop. In this age, when capitalists revive in their wealth and everyone else eats an ear of moldy corn that was reduced, that was reduced, rejected. rejected, God almighty, that was rejected by well-fed farm animals Human beings want to know, where will it end? Mothers clutch infants whose lips are too dry to wrap around a breast and, and whose eyes are swimming in bitter tears. Men of God repeating the gospel that it's not a sin to bow before the rich while those corpulent leeches live off the wealth that others create, drugs to keep them, to keep people anesthetized, religion to keep them babbling. There's a new astrology, one in which human beings are, libi are liberated, liberated. liberated from excuse me, are liberated from exploitation so the planets can revolve around the stars and men and women can dance for dance, the dance of revolving chimes in the rapture of the wind, freed from the scourge of violence. Empires will crumble when they're reduced, when, they're, when they're, they're white, their will walls. walls evaporate from the transparency of their lies. Now there's a new, now there's only a dusty book with a broken spine and shredded yellow pages. The, letter, the letters are a retired alphabet of profit and greed in charge of in humanity a in a chapter of humanity that soon will be ending because dance, because banks won't be able to afford 
the interest they've created as their worthless currency keeps burning a hole in our souls and clicks on the cement like a copper coin. Wealth gave the rich the appearance of immortality, but... But the mortality of living shared, showed. showed that they were ephemeral, like buzzards swept from their nest by a hurricane. Thank you. Oh, thank you, David. All right. Uh, Dorothy Payne is a poet, painter, who after teaching for, for two years in Guinea, Africa, is doing the same in Mexico City. Her poetry has been published in various anthologies and in her, in her book, Birthmarks. Here from uh, Mexico City is, uh, is Dottie Payne. Thank you, John and Jack and, and Karen, everyone involved in the production of this wonderful new uh, anthology. I think I was in the first one and I hope I hang around long enough to be in many more. So thank you. Uh, I'm going to read a poem that I have dedicated to the women of Guinea. Uh, I lived there for three years and worked there and I would see them outside my window in my bedroom every morning before the sun came up, going off to market to sell their wares with children on the babies on their backs, children in their hands, loads on their heads. And I realized that these are the people who feed Conakry, Guinea, the capital city of that wonderful country. I would also like to dedicate this poem to Guinea. Uh, Guineans just uh, had a presidential election. The president is 80 years old. He has, uh, uh, put forth a plan to wipe out the constitution and make himself president for life. The Guinean people are a post-colonized population and they are fighting the recolonization of their country. So the demonstrations lead to incredible violence. People are murdered and Guineans do not have guns. So we know who's doing the murdering, right? So this is my poem dedicated to the incredible uh, market women of Guinea. These women, these women who are women even before they cease being children, who carry babies on their backs even before they cease being them, who carry loads on their heads like emerging little queens burdened with the earth's best bounty, bread warm, fresh, and ready to feed the day before the sun has even risen. These women who walk like elegant antelopes, majestic necks stretched skyward, made long by all that seeking, lifting, seeing, rising, these beautiful women of Guinea, whose feet never seem to touch the ground, rather endorse, sweep, and preserve it. These women whose backs and breasts arch heavenward and assume fecund announcement, these manifestations of Oklo, origins of flesh and warm, warm loam. Praise her, this place of all beginning, shea lathered and beautifully irrefutable, her flamboyance a flaunted affront to colonial cruelty. Her very existence, a declaration of war against poverty. Praise her glisteningness, polyrhythmic refusal to acquiesce to a time linear and meaningless, not past, yet not fully present. Praise the blinding light of all existence, her
Donna, you muted yourself. Donna, right. Donna no, go. Can you hear me now? We can hear you now. Kind of go back a little. Back I lost, lost, what? I'm sorry, lost connection. <laughs> what do you want me to do, John? Keep going? Or? Well, you were about, you were about two thirds through, through the poem, I, th I think. I, I'm, I'm not really following it, but you, but, but, uh, you know, it, you know. <laughs> the second page, Dot. Praise her. Are you, are you on? Praise her. The second praise. I'm so sorry. I, I really want to honor these women and, and this. Okay, second praise her. No. Uh, this, this, praise her. This the first person. praise. The first praise her. Okay. All right. So Both. I ended with origins of flesh and warm, warm lung. Praise her. This place of all beginning. She lathered and beautifully irrefutable. Her flamboyance flaunted a front to colonial cruelty. Her very existence a declaration of war against poverty. Praise her glisteningness, her polyrhythmic refusal to acquiesce to a time near and meaningless, not past, yet not fully present. Praise this blinding light of all existence, her very breathing, her breathing and indignant insistence, her haughty hips a rebut to all attempts to eliminate her or her children. Praise these women who rise like the sun flauntingly returning its radiance, indomitable flashes of the spirit. Gaze upon them, these women who carry our loads and all enduring things, praise them, for they are all that we are, are all we have been now be, for they are us, our vivified rememory. Thank you. Sorry about the disconnect. <laughs> Happens frequently here. <laughs> I thank you. Thank you. We're very thankful that we were able to get through to you. Um, so Scott Bird, Thank you. Scott Bird is the creator of The Maybird, an ongoing work dedicated to holistic expression through poetry, art, and music. He is a member of the Revolutionary Poets Brigade of San Francisco and one of the editors of Building Socialism. Uh, Scott will read his own poem, and he'll also read uh, the contribution from uh, Fernando Rendon, who is the poet and founding director of the World Poetry Movement in Medellin, Colombia, and the organizer of the great poetry festivals there. Scott Bird. Thank you, John. <clears throat> My poem is called The Real Lady Liberty. I dream of the revolution every night in the light of firestorms, orange glow on the fresh mortar of the uprising. I dream of the cries of the people, those yearning, led by a woman with black velvet arms, her hair is a flame, a torch, her panther's paw balled in a fist a beacon unto all of us congregating in the street ash blizzard. I dream of the nation's foundations shifting beneath us. It was a house built upon the sand of which we were amply warned by one of the prophets. The independent declaration ran deaf on ears at the hands of the pursuit of currency, but I dreamt the new city did bend from the strewn sky, shimmering in the grains it created as it crashed at the bedrock layer. The towers shook, the curtain rippled, the statues shook and toppled, and the flags of traitors to the free burned up in its percussive blow. I dreamed of the real Lady Liberty. And when the sky returned to itself again, so did we. No one was above the other anymore, only the mountains above the sea. Thank you.
And then this poem by Fernando Rendon of Colombia is called Palestina. Mestizos, somos árabes también. Alguien que llegó a España hace diez siglos no circula. Conoce las estrellas, es caravana en el desierto. Sarracenos con alfanjes y rodelas cabalgan todavía las llanuras hacia mezquitas asombrosas, anegando espacios y aposentos con una lengua de medias lunas. Otra vez persas y hebreros codiciando nuestros ríos de miel, prendiendo fuego al campamento, flechando la ternura. De nuevo, la langosta asolando los olivos. Dulce Palestina que guardas tu rostro tras un pasamontañas. Y a pesar de todo, aún zumban cedros milenarios. Danza el cielo un son de júbilo sobre tu amor armado. Es la guerra de tus niños entre tierras de nadie que florecen. Mientras bulle la alquimia en las arterías. Estamos advertidos. Un poder invisible nos escalpa. Palestine. Half castes, we are Arabs as well. Somebody who came to Spain 10 centuries ago courses through us, knows the stars, is a caravan in the desert. Saracens with back swords and bucklers still ride the plains towards amazing mosques, flooding spaces and chambers in the tongue of half moons. Again, Persians and Hebrews coveting our honey rivers, setting fire to the camp, shooting tenderness with arrows. Again, the locusts blighting the olive trees. The sweet Palestine hiding your face behind the balaclava. And still, the millionaire cedars buzz. The sky dances a joyful sound above your armed love. It is your children's war amidst wastelands that blossom while alchemy boils in the arteries. We have been warned. An invisible power is scalping us. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. I wanted to say that uh, Scott is also the um, uh, the uh, the artist behind the uh, uh, the cover of the anthology. So um, that's uh, Scott is also a, uh, uh, a a painter and artist, also and phot photographer. Beautiful work. Thank you, Scott. Um, William Taylor Jr. lives and writes in the Tenderloin of San Francisco and is a recipient of the 2013 Kathy Acker Award. Pretty Words to Say, published by Six Foot Swells Press, is his latest collection of poetry. Uh, unmute William. Uh. There we go. Thank you. Hi. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Uh, thanks for including me in the beautiful anthology. Uh, thanks to Jack and everyone who put this together. Uh, I'm going to read my poem called The Glow of It. The years and the governments and the newspaper headlines have taught us we are disposable, have torn us down and replaced us with cardboard and ghosts but our blood remembers how to sing. And even now we set our wooden hearts alight and burn like the midnight sun. Even now we are drunk on joy and love, sorrow and rage. Even now we dance upon the ruins of what has come before and we summon forth new fire. And even now the soldiers and the police with their jack boots and billy clubs they cease their marching and give pause in the glow of it. Thank you. 
And thank you, William. Mauro Fortissimo, Argentinian born, Italian American, moved to San Francisco in, 18, in 1981, where he works and resides. And Mauro is a poet, musician, and painter. And uh, he's going to read a, a poem by Alberto Masala, who is a Sardinian, amoral, thinks that poetry cannot speak about freedom, but be, deep, deep, but be deeply ethical. That's why he thinks poetry must speak of liberation. And uh, he lives in Boulogne. Mauro? Thank you, John, and everybody else. I want to dedicate this poem to the people of Bolivia and the wise voting back to return to socialism. Viva Levo. Um, this is by Alberto Massala. And it's called Ma è un'altra vita. And uh, forgive some of my Argentinian missed uh, pronunciations. <laughs> Noi siamo in trappola in una confortante gravità. Un oceano di vita potrebbe soffocarsi facilmente. Per poterlo affrontare in questo nostro tempo senza uccita, duro di pronunciare, preferisco una musica più dura, più dura della pacata musica di un libro, dove talvolta brucia e anche travoca la rivolta, ma sempre così breve, che alla fine serpeggia agonizzante davanti alle ragioni che impone la sua legge di realtà. E quando prene affonda nella carne è una ferita chiara, attraverso la carne come artiglio, lasciando questo segno di chiarezza e, e ci presenta tutti questi morti. Forse questa poesia può incrociarsi di de, ruggine le sbarre per credere che forse si romperamo Ho detto forse, ancora non è siamo sicuri. Forse siamo l'essenza di ogni rivolta morta in apprenza, in apparenza, il metodico battito del cuore, di rabbia antica e ruggine del tempo, ma non si può vedere all'occhio nudo. E coni, sono qui, Ancora sul bordo del mio tempo, mentre prossime il tutto e chi non sa niente altro. E visto quanti sono, non possiamo lasciare alla parola. Adesso vamo oltre questa poesia che se l'interrompe qui. È necessaria una foglia migliore. Alberto Massala. But it's a different life. We are trapped in a comforting gravity, a notion of life could easily suffocate us. In order to be able to face it in this dead end time of ours, hard to articulate, I prefer music to be harder than the quiet music of a book, where it sometimes burns and even overflows the revolt, but always so short, that at the end it meanders agonizing in front of reason, which imposes its laws of reality, and when it presses, plunges into the flesh, and a clear wound, it crosses the flesh like claw, leaving this sign of clarity, and presents us with all this death. Maybe this poem can encrust the bars with rust in order to believe that maybe they will break. I say maybe. Still, we're not sure they will. Maybe we are the essence of every apparently dead revolt, the methodical beat of the earth, of ancient anger and rest of time. But you can see it with the naked eye. Behold, here I am, still on the rim of my time while mourning continues and there is nothing else there. Have you seen how many they are? We cannot leave them to wars. Now they go beyond this poem that stops here. 
a better madness is needed. Thank you. Yeah. Cheers. Uh, Ludi Lanini is a member of the Revolutionary Poets Brigade of Rome, Italy. Her first book of poems is about to be published there in Rome. Hi, uh, thanks to Jack and everyone. So I'm going to read in Italian, which is my mother tongue, and then the English translation by Alessandra Bava, who is a friend and poet in the anthology. Piano tattico. Tu hai bisogno essenziale di uno zar e l'Europa può davvero, Dio denaro, accontentarti. Ti diranno a denti stretti che il piano tattico è passato di moda da tempo. Ti rideranno dietro, stratega, ragionevolmente. Ma questo è altro per dire stop. Non c'è più posto per tutto il troppo che ho visto. La guerra sempre altrove, ma grondante, da ogni angolo di strada quotidiana. I pianti ondosi, sfranti in alto mare, riecheggiare confusi sullo sfondo. Tu solo a braccare, sprenato, occhi chini di sangue senza posa, entrate destinate a non durare. Il veleno serpeggiare. Sotterraneo, persistente, la colpa impotente, eppure pungolo sotto pelle. Devi capire che la coscienza è roba per vecchi avvizziti sotto sale. Ma ci sei dentro. Da sempre vuoi tradire l'intelletto, sospendere il giudizio, lasciarti trascinare a marciare, marcire, gridare, intonare antichi cori, consumare ancora una volta vecchi testi, stantii, striscioni, consunti, a perdere, sociale, con stile. Ok, now English version. Tactical plan. You have a basic need for exar, and Europe may truly, God money, satisfy you. With clenched teeth, they will tell you that the tactical plan has long become out of fashion. They will reasonably laugh behind you, strategist. But this and more to stop you. There is no more place for everything. The too much I have seen. War always elsewhere, but dripping at every corner of the daily road. The broken wavy cries on the high seas, echoing again, bewildered against the backdrop. Yeah. You all, yeah. oh, <laughs> you all alone hunting a moke, bent bloody eyes without a break, earnings destined to never last, the poison meandering, persistent underground, the impotent yet prodding guilt under the skin. You have to understand the conscience is tough, procure the withered old people, but you are part of it. You have always wished to betray the intellect of suspending judgment of getting dragged, to march, to rot, to cry, to start singing ancient choruses, to wear out stale old texts, once more worn out banners, social with style. Thank you. Grazie mille. Prego. <laughs> Grazie a voi. Elizabeth Marino is with the Revolutionary Poets Brigade of Chicago. Her chapbooks are Debris and Ceremonies. 
Her poem and memoir collection, Asylum, is soon forthcoming. Actually, it's here. <laughs> it's here now. Thank you all. Some time ago, Jack sent out a call for visions to a building socialism. And after the summer, uh, this was my vision. High alert. One or the other of us stumbles, slips into the bathroom. One or the other cat slips into our warm spot and nestles in. We had packed little for this trip and probably will voyage out, return from the other side unchanged. Asia sky and marbled sky split by a rising sun, another day on this side. There is a light within, seen when eyes dim or blaze, lighthouse beacons. This is a time we remember our dreams. We count our dead and cannot gather to mourn. Last night, the weather woman warned to keep your notification device close. Funnel clouds might touch down not so far away. Thunderstorms boomed, crashed outside our sealed windows. One cat reared up onto my edge of the bed, a flash of light for Corona. Carefully tuck in that blanket of death covering 220,000 strong. In this singular wave of genocide by negligence, omission and commission, who even knew besides countless homeless advocates that poor people doubled and tripled up and many Latinx people were best guessed at by look Unmute yourself. Uh, you got muted. But wait, wait, wait. Uh, um. You shouldn't. Yeah, uh, you, you got cut a, yeah, go go back and you know I, I don't you know start wherever you want. So start somewhere in the middle and you you. Okay, Asia Lake and marbled sky split by a rising sun, another day on this side. There is a light within, seen when eyes dim or blaze, lighthouse beacons. This is a time we remember our dreams. We count our dead and cannot gather to mourn. Last night, the weather woman warned to keep your notification device close. Funnel clouds might touch down not so far away. Thunderstorms boomed, crashed outside our sealed windows. One cat reared up onto my edge of the bed, a flash of light for Corona. Carefully tuck in that blanket of death, covering 220,000 strong in this singular wave of genocide by negligence, omission and commission. Who even knew, besides countless homeless advocates, that poor people doubled and tripled up, and many Latinx people are best guessed at by looks as black or white? Where did all these Latin people come from? Don't bother to ask embarrassing questions or work for more accurate census. For practice, they moved generators and Island National Guard just before two major hurricanes in preparation. Take away the mental health clinics from people struggling with multi-generational PTSD. Bang, bang, they shot you dead all around. It just never did stop. A steady income, a steady, clean, safe place to lay your head every night, two or three people to trust for a start. 
struggling to keep ourselves whole without cutting or a whiskey neat. Push back this blanket of death. Clear a plot, a seed bed to sink into, grow some roots, even thrive and feel the sun lick our newly sprouted leaves. Let us build a new platform upon this killing floor. Thank you. And thank you, Elizabeth. Our final reader for the for this reading is uh, Karen Melander Magoon, who has published in many anthologies and sung major opera roles in Europe for two decades. She has five CDs online and a video of her Lily, a musical. She's an interfaith minister and one of the editors of this anthology. Her new book of poetry is A Year of Anguish, A Time for Miracles. She's, all, she's gonna read a poem of her own, plus a poem from a Pauline Craig, who was a member of the Revolutionary Poets Brigade of San Francisco, but who passed in the spring of 2020. She was a poet and journalist who worked for years with uh, The Beat Within, a journal of poetry and prose by imprisoned teenagers in the San Francisco Bay Area. Here is Karen. Thank you so much, John. Thank you. Um, I'm going to start with Pauline's poem that gives us a moment to remember this lovely poet whom we lost this year and uh, to hear some of her words. She was always very concerned with war and the death from war. Pauline Craig, who killed us? Who is so hurt? so hungry, so humiliated, so angry, so poor, so anguished, so outraged, so frightened, so devastated, so desperate, so hopeless, so profoundly sad, so fed up, so full of hate for us, and being so committed to stopping our attacks on their people, but having no military of their own, that they would deliberately sacrifice each of their 19 young lives to commandeer four commercial American airplanes to smash them into the World Trade Center towers and the Pentagon missing their fourth target in a furious attempt to kill our government, our economy, and our military, who have assaulted their poor peoples every day for years, who have hated us so much and for so long that they would rather die than tolerate our country's cruelty to their beloved homelands another day. Maybe it was an Iraqi boy, dead on an opening table of kerosene burns from an overturned lamp, because neither his family home nor all of Baghdad had electricity because of the relentless US bombing in the first Iraqi war. The doctor had no anesthetic, nor antibiotics or other medicines to assuage the pain and the infections of his superiating burn wounds. Maybe the boy commanded the hijackers to attack the stalwart American edifices. The traffic jam was immense. Car carcasses, trucks, jeeps, troop carriers and buses were burned out and gutted all along the highway. American soldiers spray painted signs Yankees won, ragheads zero, on the sides of the trashed vehicles. Charcoal bodies were strewn miles wide. They couldn't escape our relentless bombing. They left baby shoes, 
scarves, toys, notebooks, and their exploded bodies all along the busted road. Iraqi people were incinerated in their vehicles. Feral dogs feasted on their flesh. Perhaps it was a Zapatista soldier from Chiapas in the Mexican South, her face disguised with a scarf ever since January 1st, 1994, when their revolution commenced against the Mexican government the day NAFTA kicked in, cheating the corn farmers, the beans, beef, and coffee growers of just prices for their produce by flooding Mexico with cheap food from El Norte. The value of the peso plunged, and there was only poorly paid work and little food because Mexican fruits and vegetables were grown strictly for export, mostly for Amer Indian for Amer Indian dinners, young Mexican men snuck across the border into the country that was responsible for their huge financial losses. They couldn't return to their families in Mexico for fear they'd be caught trying to maneuver back up across the border into the U.S. again. Bill Clinton sent the Mexican government eighty million dollars in relief money slated mainly to bail out American investors who had lost big bucks in investments gone bad in Mexico. The Mexican government spent its share of the American bailout money to finance planes, tanks, troops, to bomb and invade and massacre the ancient indigenous Mayan tribe of Chiapas. And that is a large excerpt from Pauline's poetry. So that gives us a moment to remember this lovely woman and her passionate, passionate poetry and concerns for the world. So my poem is about cyclones, really. It's called Devastation and Prayers. It's original title was Amphon, which is the name of the cyclone that hit in May of this year. But it is also a remembrance of the damage of cyclones, starting with Bola, 1970, 300,000 people killed in Bangladesh. Odisha, 9,658 killed in 1990. And now in May of this year, only 80 were killed, $13 billion in damage. But it is a reminder to us that nature rules as she should. And it's up to us to help nature and to help bridge what should not really be a gap between us and nature, to think of climate change, to think of helping others who are more devastated by climate change than many of us, and to keep in mind that we need to partner with nature. So this is my poem about the last cyclone called Devastation and Prayers. I am Amphon. I am a cyclone. I rip into people's homes, people in tents, people who have nothing and I take the nothing they have. I am Amphon. My name means sky. Umpun, they say, I rip across Bengal where tiny tide pools make playgrounds for children and small things. I cannot help the force I bring my throat bellows. I pour floods of water on tiny things. I wipe out life like giving birth. Nature pushes my belly and wind and water surge and devastate. Mother of wind and water and all life blows viruses and microbes tinier than even I imagine. 
Into these same tents I now destroy. I blow and scream, ruled by my mother. I cannot stop my wind and water. I swallow up roofs and bridges. I drink villages and spit them out. And when it is over, I am still Amphon. I am sky. My clouds gather and I pray for the world beneath me. Well, thank you so much, Karen. It was beautiful. And thank, uh, thank, thanks to all of you from uh, you know, the entire uh, Revolutionary Poets Brigade of San Francisco and all the, uh, all the chapters around the world. And uh, we're going to be having another uh, reading here, uh, same time next week. And Scott Bird is going to be the uh, the uh, the MC or a host for for that one. And uh, we invite you all to uh, you know to uh, to join us, uh, you know, either here or or on YouTube. And this will be this has been streamed on YouTube and will be uh, uh, being recorded and will be on our poetry channel very soon. So if uh, you know if you or any of your friends missed it, you can see it there. So, well, thank you very much for coming, and uh, you know we'll just uh, yeah, see you next time. You. See you soon. Thank you. And thank you, you can you can unmute and say anything you want to right now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Grazie. 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 Beautiful poetry tonight. Today it was really wonderful. Thank you, everyone. Hasta la próxima. Hasta la próxima. Ciao, ciao. Hasta la próxima.